We'll take just a moment to have a subtle change here. Well, Pittsburgh is a city of many things, but among the notable parts of Pittsburgh, it is a city of ketchup. Known as the, king, as the king of condiments, in the early 1900s, Henry Hines reinvented the sauce as he added ripe tomatoes and vinegar with natural preservatives to make ketchup a full-on frenzy in the American diet. These days, a bottle can be found in roughly 97% of American households and nearly every restaurant in the world as well. Moreover, worldwide sales of ketchup is a staggering $765 million industry. If Jesus really wants to tell us Pittsburghers about the kingdom of God this morning, wouldn't it be wonderful if he said the kingdom of God was like a bottle of rich, delicious Heinz ketchup. Now, Kelly's sister works on that brand at Kraft Heinz, and she didn't even have to pay me to do that. Unfortunately, though, we don't hear about ketchup this morning. Instead, Jesus tells us about mustard. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, Jesus says. Mustard first emerged in Europe around 8,000 years ago. Archaeologists have found mustard seeds in ancient Mesopotamia and catacombs of Egyptian pharaohs, both Greeks and Romans, ate versions of mustard by mixing the crushed seeds in with grapes and spices. The mustard that we know today was introduced in, to the U.S. at the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis, the home of that baseball team playing the Pirates over these days. The famous mustard seed is notable for its incredibly small size, though not technically the smallest of all seeds. Its diameter is measured at less than a tenth of an inch. Put 750 mustard seeds together and they weigh merely a gram. So the reign of God, Jesus says, is like this. A mighty kingdom, a paragon of power, a life-changing and world-transforming presence of God is all like this tiny mustard seed. Well, if the definition of hyperbole means to make exaggerated claims, Jesus' comparison of a small mustard seed with the great kingdom of God provides a juxtaposition for the ages. So why mustard? Why should the kingdom of heaven be compared to something so small. In gaining a grasp of such a statement, careful, careful readers of Scripture will glance back at the book of Ezekiel where God says, I will take a shoot from the very top of a cedar and plant it, and it will produce branches and bear fruit and become a splendid cedar. Birds of every kind will nest in it. They will find shelter in the shade of its branches. To be clear, the cedar tree, not the mustard bush, was historically the notable symbol of influence to the ears of those listening to Jesus. Powerful kingdoms are supposed to be like the massive cedars of Lebanon. Cedar trees are enormous, and they're stable, and they're strong. They provide lovely shade in the summertime, and the birds and the squirrels regularly occupy their branches. Drawn from the Old Testament, that a mighty political kingdom is like a great tree, the cedar. As a metaphor, 
becomes that thing that is mighty and majestic. And it would be the correct image for this kingdom of heaven. But instead of a majestic cedar, Jesus with a twinkle in his eye plays on that popular image. What does Jesus offer? A humble mustard plant. The kingdom of heaven, well, it's like an overgrown shrub, Jesus says. Greatness in Jesus' eye does not come in the form that we expect. However, despite this unusual switch, the point is the same. The kingdom grows to enormous size from just very tiny beginnings. Now, as you know, our family spent last week in Virginia. We saw Kelly's brother's family, then we visited my mother and brother's family as well. Before we left, Kelly and I spent some time out in front of the manse, picking weeds from our gorgeous garden beds. And when we returned, well, you know what happened. In less than a week, those weeds came right up again. As I understand it, like our weeds, wild mustard is also hard to control. The mustard plant tends to take over where it is not wanted. It attracts birds among farmers' fields where they are not desired. And that, said Jesus, is what the kingdom is like. A pungent shrub with dangerous takeover properties. By invoking the mustard seed as a symbol of the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is telling us that this kingdom's coming is not necessarily going to be what is expected. Nor will it be tidy, nor will it be orderly. Rather, the kingdom's coming will overrun. It will take over and it will transform. Likewise, our life as the church seeks to welcome God's presence. Good people of faith, you and I included, live lives toward that direction, looking for good news in the small and unexpected moments of trust, displaying God's handiwork that continues to grow. A professor I know wonders if the role of the church is like a type of language school for the kingdom of God. In the same way that you might learn a, a language to prepare for a trip to a foreign country, he wonders if we come to church to prepare for the ways that we will live in the kingdom of heaven. He says that by faith we keep plugging away at activities which look silly and meaningless to the world, yet these moments nourish the very seed of new creation. We come to open an ancient book called the Bible, looking to find truths within it that are anything but ancient. We keep gathering at sickbeds and at deathbeds and whisper our prayers for the spirit of the resurrection to be with us in life and in death. Here we learn things like praise and community and welcome. We keep drizzling water onto squirming infants and popping cubes of white bread into our mouths in the sincere faith that, though, that through the Spirit, baptism and communion don't just mean something, they mean everything. Living into God's kingdom, well, that life doesn't happen all at once. It's not always clear. Like the mustard seed, life tends to show up in surprise after surprise, changing our expectations. It grows in uncontrollable ways. It welcomes those who at first are not readily wanted. And likewise, in its persistence, its growth is impossible to stop. Now, every once in a while, when 
I'm at a training seminar for pastors, or I meet a relative that I haven't seen in a while. The question is asked, well, what kind of church do I serve as a pastor? And without missing a beat, my response says, well, I serve a small church in a small town. A small church? What is God able to do with a small church? And so for some, looks may be deceiving. However, as I see it, God said, I need a community of people who are so committed to one another that they know each other deeply and then continue to love each other anyway. God said, I need the old and the young and the in-between to interact regularly across generations. I need them out of love to sing and to eat together. I need them to sew bags and hand out produce and bring in cake mix and bake pies and put out Christmas toys as God's children of every age work together. God said, I need people with the maturity to agree to disagree and to stick together even though they hold very different viewpoints on difficult issues. I need people who will welcome and appreciate a soloist song even if it's not perfect and invite the children to come up to the front and sing with our guitars and drums of the praise band. God said, I need people who will tend to those little bags for children to play with in the pews rather than send their noisy and busy bodies away. I need people who will go to the football game just to see the marching band so that when all of these children grow up, wherever they go, they will know that the cloud of witnesses is surrounding them with love and prayer. And so God made a small church. It's flawed and it's broken. It is certainly unassuming, but it is authentic. Just come as you are, so that we may grow together. But after all, it is the smallest of seeds that Jesus points to, unexpectedly chosen, continually persistent in its welcome. Jesus says, if you want to know about the kingdom of heaven, well, it's like the smallest of these seeds. But when it has grown, thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.